Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I hope you all had a great lunch. Uh, my name is Dan Martin from the University of Plymouth, uh, and it's my job to chair uh, this afternoon's session uh, entitled Research Towards Treatments of Long COVID. Uh, I'm an intensive care physician, and I spent the first wave of the uh, pandemic in London, uh, where we were really sort of all just fighting to survive. Uh, and we gave no real thought to the long-term consequences of this new disease that we were um, facing. That's why this conference has been so very fascinating for me uh, to see what has happened to some of the patients uh, who we treated uh, back then and, and, and since then. Uh, and it's interesting to see that sort of things that we had began to learn in intensive care medicine uh, are now becoming uh, so, so prevalent in uh, the treatment of this disease. Uh, we used to think that surviving was to, just simply enough, but, but now uh, it's really obvious from this conference that surviving with health, uh, well-being and, and a good quality of life uh, is so very much uh, more important. I've really enjoyed all the sessions so far in the meeting uh, and I'm really excited about this session now because we have four fantastic speakers uh, who are going to speak to you uh, and then I'm going to be joined by a couple more colleagues at the end uh, where we'll have a discussion uh, after the four talks. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Betty Rahman from the University of Oxford. And Betty's going to talk to us today about um, a trial of metabolic therapy in long COVID. Thank you very much for joining us today, Betty. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm Betty Rahman. I'm a senior clinical research fellow and an academic cardiologist from the Radcliffe Department of Medicine, University of Oxford. And I'm just going to talk to you about the rationale for um, a clinical trial I'm leading um, here in Oxford um, in long COVID patients whose main complaint is fatigue. So we know that long COVID is a serious problem and has affected the lives of millions of people globally. Fortunately, through the dedication, hard work and perseverance of so many researchers, patients, advocacy groups, we have now been able to peel away the mask of this dreadful disease and um, uncover some potential mechanisms for ongoing symptoms. As we've already learned over the past couple of days that there are several distinct and interconnected path pathological phenotypes that are emerging as potential mechanisms for persistent symptoms in patients. And this really just summarizes the various mechanisms that are being discussed. So dysregulated immune response, excessive clotting, endothelial dysfunction, mitochondrial um, dysfunction, potential for other viruses to be activated because of an altered immune response, um, uh, an altered gut biome, um, and, and, and an autoimmune response to um, viral antigens, which um, might mimic the uh, self proteins. Uh, now, imaging has played a particularly central role in the diagnosis and monitoring of severity of disease in the acute setting um, and correlated reasonably well with the way people were feeling, how breathless they were. Um, and in fact, there have been a number of follow-up studies emerging that also demonstrate evidence of persistent abnormalities in the lung, on chest x-ray, at follow-up, um, and even on CT scans uh, 12 months from the infection. And as technology is becoming more and more advanced, uh, we are also able to detect subclinical changes in organs such as the lungs uh, in survivors of COVID-19 that are not detectable on standard clinical tests like CT scans or chest x-ray. So on the left um, are images from a study, a study uh, led by investigators in Oxford where um, Grist and colleagues demonstrated that even in patients who did not re require hospital admission and who currently have normal CT chests and who may be breathless, there were changes or abnormalities in gas exchange at the level of the lung that were detectable on specialized MRI scans that map out um, the, 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 the diffusion of uh, this gas xenon. Now, um, on the right is a longitudinal MRI study of 785 
um, individuals from the UK Biobank, half of whom uh, had a prior infection with SARS-CoV-2 and the other uh, were controls. And, and essentially um, what we're also seeing is that big data sets, population data, um, is now able to reveal the differences, subtle differences in, in, in uh, structure of the brain and organs uh, in those who are previously exposed to SARS-CoV-2, and that some of these may be linked to uh, brain fog and symptoms of cognitive impairment in individuals currently suffering from long COVID. But what if you had all these advanced imaging tests and blood tests and all of them came back normal? Could there still be something causing your symptoms? So actually, this is a real challenge for many physicians um, and patients um, suffering from long COVID. And it really highlights uh, the residual gaps in our knowledge. Um, and I'd really like to take you through a similar journey that I experienced. So, um, so we've led a, a follow-up study, a small cohort uh, of 58 um, individuals with moderate to severe infection in the acute setting. Uh, and we undertook a, a range of investigations, including multi-organ MRI scans, blood tests, series of questionnaires, and also undertook a cardiopulmonary exercise test to better understand what might be causing ongoing symptoms in patients. And what we observed in this longitudinal study was that although some patients um, had objective markers of abnormal health, so there were changes in their lungs, many had you know, normal um, investigations, normal blood tests, um, MRI scans, but still continued to feel extremely fatigued and exhausted. So in other words, we had patients who had completely normal tests, but were feeling profound symptoms of exhaustion and fatigue. I'm sure this is a very familiar story, story for many patients suffering from long COVID. So we then looked into the findings from our cardiopulmonary exercise tests. Um, and on this graph, you see the peak oxygen consumption of patients uh, at three months from the onset of their severe infection. So these were hospitalized patients, of course, um, you know, some of this might be related to the severity of disease um, and, and the need for uh, ventilation or support during the acute infection. But you see that they had quite abnormal peak oxygen consumption. And even at six months, when many of the other parameters recovered, they still had abnormal uh, oxygen consumption uh, when compared to an age and comorbidity matched control. So this finding... Um, it was quite interesting. We also observed that there was a buildup of lactic acid quite early on uh, in their muscles, so they had an early anaerobic threshold. And this alerted us to the possibility that metabolic inefficiencies in the muscles may also be contributing to ongoing symptoms in patients. Now, what's even more interesting is that Following our study, there have been a number of other studies um, in parallel um, and after that have um, shown very similar findings. So I'm uh, showing you these two studies because they were quite comprehensive and, and, and really sort of digs into the mechanism for um, an impaired oxygen consumption in patients. So on, in the study on the left, investigators from Harvard Boston assessed 10 patients a year after they had COVID, uh, and we're still reporting marked fatigue and exercise intolerance um, and 10 non-COVID controls using invasive cardiopulmonary exercise tests. So what that means is they're put on a bike um, and they have their exercise test, but they also have catheters in their heart measuring the oxygen concentration in the, uh, in the left and the right side, as well as at uh, the pressures in the heart throughout exercise. So it's quite a comprehensive study. They also had uh, data on cardiac function um, because echocardiography was performed. Now, uh, the graph here depicts changes in oxygen consumption of patients post-acute COVID and controls indicated by the pink line and changes in cardiac index indicated by the purple line. So they're plotted on both ends of the um, graph, VO2 on the left ax left y-axis and cardiac index on the right y-axis. And on the x-axis is the uh, systemic oxygen extraction. So how much oxygen is being um, extracted from the muscles during exercise. 
And essentially what this study showed were three important findings. So patients with persistent symptoms of fatigue and ex exercise intolerance exhibited marked reduction in aerobic capacity when compared to age and sex matched controls, as indicated by the blue, uh, sorry, the, the red uh, line at peak exercise. The second is that this occurred despite a normal cardiac index. So despite the heart's function being normal, there was impaired oxygen consumption. And the third was that this was accompanied by a reduced oxygen extraction in patients post-COVID. So that there's something happening at the level of the skeletal muscle, the mitochondria are not able to, um, to use up the oxygen efficiently to provide energy uh, and, and maybe contributing to uh, the patient's symptoms of exercise intolerance. Now on the right is another study of 50 patients with long COVID symptoms who also underwent um, cycle ergometer CPAT. Now in this study, the investigators described the lactate dynamics in patients during exercise depicted by the graph above and below um, measured fatty acid oxidation rate. Um, and this is estimated using a stoichiometric equation that, um, that requires VO2 and VCO2. And so uh, I hope you can appreciate, so there are four lines here, the four lines represent, um, so that the blue and the pink line represent long COVID patients with and without comorbidities, blue being with comorbidities and pink without. The gray are um, historic controls with metabolic syndrome and the black line represents non-COVID um, non uh, healthy controls who are moderately active. And this work again beautifully demonstrates that in the long COVID or PASC patients, there's a buildup of lactic acid or lactate uh, very early on during exercise when compared to healthy controls uh, and comorbidity matched controls. And they elegantly demonstrated that this is accompanied by impaired fatty acid oxidation rates in patients during peak exercise. Again, highly suggestive of mitochondrial dysfunction. But to what extent is this COVID specific? Or is this just the effect of any infection or severe disease? So this is a matter of debate with some scientists strongly believing that SARS-CoV-2 induces long-standing mitochondrial damage by directly hijacking the mitochondria, controlling its biogenesis and fueling pro-inflammatory pathways. Now, in the study on the right conducted by investigators from King's College London, mitochondrial analyses of peripheral blood mononuclear cells from seven hospitalized COVID-19 patients were compared to controls without COVID and nine controls with some other chest infection. Now, obviously, these are really small numbers and the study has many limitations. But the what the investigators demonstrated was that patients with COVID-19 not only had significantly reduced ATP linked to respiration and reserve capacity um, when compared to non-COVID controls, but they also demonstrated marked reduction in maximum respiration and reserve capacity um, when compared to controls with other chest infections. So the authors collectively concluded that these findings were highly suggestive of compromised mitochondrial function. And, and these hypotheses have basically been supported by work from other groups suggesting the potential for mitochondria to promote um, uh, chronic, also to promote chronic inflammatory signaling in patients. So with this in mind, we were um, intrigued by the possibility of therapies that could potentially restore mitochondrial function in patients uh, and how uh, this would impact individuals with symptoms of fatigue. Now, one way to, um, so one of the problems we have is to actually measure mitochondrial function in patients. Um, the most traditional way is by doing invasive procedures by taking a biopsy. Um, and another way, as I've shown you, is by doing cardiopulmonary exercise tests, but this provides indirect measures and is really quite exhaustive for patients. I mean, we've had um, patients uh, essentially being extremely fatigued after doing cardiopulmonary exercise tests. So it's not the most ideal form of investigation um, in our long COVID population. So one way to directly measure mitochondrial function is using a technique called 31 phosphorus magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy. It's a non-invasive MRI technique which allows us to assess the relative concentrations of metabolites which uh, harbor or carry phosphorus in them. And to explain this, I'd like to revisit some physiology in very basic terms, which 
is in no means exhaustive. So we know that ATP is the energy currency of the cell um, needed for several biological processes um, and needs to be continuously replenished to sustain myocyte contractile function. Now the muscle stores of ATP are small, so during intense exercise, other metabolic pathways must be activated to maintain the required rates of ATP synthesis. And these include the synthesis of phosphocreatine and glycolytic pathways. Now phosphocreatine can be viewed as a rechargeable battery that quickly replenishes uh, uh, ATP uh, required for muscle contraction. However, both phosphocreatine and glycolysis can only maintain ATP supply for up to a minute. So there is a need for a more sustained mechanism for ATP resynthesis. And this is where the mitochondria, the powerhouse or the power factory of the cells step in. The mitochondria through its complex machinery metabolizes or, uh, or processes equivalents of um, carbohydrates, amino acids and fatty acids uh, via oxidative phosphorylation to synthesize more ATP. Now, because ATP has a short half-life, the high energy phosphates need to be transported in a more stable form, which is phosphocreatine, to the, um, the, the sarcomeric proteins or to the myofilament. And the recovery of phosphocreatine appears to be a very reliable estimate of how well the mitochondria is functioning and its oxidative uh, phosphorylation capacity, with several studies now showing that this recovery seems to be important and correlates moderately with functional capacity and exercise tolerance uh, of individuals. So what does this look like on 31 phosphorus magnetic resonance spectroscopy? So at the bottom is a typical spectra of phosphorus metabolites in the skeletal muscle acquired using 31P MRS. In the interest of time, I've highlighted the key metabolites on the spectra. Inorganic phosphate or PI, phosphocreatine, the largest peak, and three ATP molecules, which are always in equilibrium. Now, the relative concentration of the metabolites can be computed by the height of the peak and can be monitored during five during exercise and following uh, rest. And so on the top here um, are a series of spectra from the calf muscle that was acquired dynamically during uh, five minutes of plantar flexion exercise and rest. And they're basically multiple spectra stacked on top of each other. And this is derived from an MRS, um, uh, MRS acquisition of calf muscle. Now, focusing first on the largest peak, which is PCR, our rechargeable battery. During five minutes of exercise, what you see is the amplitude of PCR drops. And in parallel, there's a rise in inorganic phosphate and a chemical shift in its position due to a change in pH. When the person stops the exercise, you then see a recovery of phosphocreatine amplitude and a restoration of cellular pH. Importantly, when you plot these changes of individual metabolites on the y-axis and time over x-axis, what you see are these beautiful graphs. Now, the blue line indicates the phosphocreatine utilization and recovery. When, fo when focusing on the recovery, it is possible to model this mathematically and compute this um, compute compute the rate uh, constant or compute the uh, the rate at which it recovers, and this is called tau. And what I'm showing you here is an example of a patient with significant fatigue and exercise intolerance, um, and they have a prolonged tau, which is 131 seconds, when compared to a control of a similar age without any symptoms of fatigue. So we're actually now providing other evidence uh, using very specialized technology of mitochondrial dysfunction in patients, which is very specific to the pathology. So given the potential that we can measure mitochondrial function directly without exhausting our patients, we've been really keen to explore uh, and evaluate the efficacy of metabolic therapies in fatigue-dominant long COVID patients with evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction. And one such therapy in the market is uh, AXA 1125, a drug manufactured by an American biotech called Accela Therapeutics, which has marked beneficial effects on inflammation, mitochondrial biogenesis, and insulin sensitivity in a specific population of patients uh, who actually had non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. 
Um, so what is this drug? AXA 1125 is a mixture of five amino acids, um, uh, including leucine, isoleucine, valine, uh, arginine, glutamine, and NAC. Three of the branch chain amino acids promote glucose uptake, increase insulin sensitivity, and promote fasty acid oxidation. Arginine increases nitric oxide bioavailability, reduces ammonia. Uh, arginine and glutamine, as well as NAC, have anti-inflammatory uh, properties um, and reduces the uh, burden of oxidative stress uh, in, in the tissue. So as you can see, this mixture has the potential to restore mitochondrial metabol metabolism, but also target some of the other pathophysiological uh, mechanisms that have been suggested to contribute to ongoing symptoms in patients. So we've been really excited to test this treatment in uh, patients with fatigue dominant long COVID. So I'm now conducting a clinical trial in Oxford, which is a randomized double-blind placebo control trial, um, where approximately 40 patients with uh, fatigue dominant long COVID uh, will be randomly assigned to either drug or placebo for a duration of 28 days. We're assessing mitochondrial respiration, uh, skeletal muscle metabolism using, non, uh, using 31 phosphorus uh, skeletal muscle MRS, um, and patients will um, do plantar flexion exercise for a few minutes and, um, and rest to then uh, assess the tau and recovery rate constant um, in individuals. We also, uh, we're also measuring uh, the symptom burden in patient as well as the exercise tolerance on six minute walk test. The primary endpoint of this study is uh, the change in recovery rate constant across treatment groups. And the secondary endpoint points as listed on the slide are um, fatigue score, six minute walk distance, and uh, we've got some safety and tolerability uh, endpoints. So I'm pleased to say that our study is well underway with nearly half the subjects recruited. The inclusion and exclusion criteria are really very strict as this is a pilot phase, um, phase to a study. And it has been extremely important for us to control for confounders such as comorbidities, which may also affect um, mitochondrial function. We are including uh, patients with severe fatigue lasting more than three months after SARS-CoV-2 infection and with symptoms that are unexplained by other diseases. For this small study, we are excluding individuals with significant comorbidities and other causes of fatigue. And we expect to complete the study by early June this year. So watch this space. So to summarize, um, we have made tremendous progress in our understanding of the potential mechanisms that underlie long COVID in a relatively short time, time frame. And this is really due to the dedication of so many researchers, patients and advocacy groups. Structural imaging has played an important role in tracking the burden of post-COVID uh, sequelae, but there are marked associations between imaging and persistent symptoms. Mitochondrial dysfunction may play a role in persistently fatigued patients without objective evidence of organ damage or overt inflammation. I hope I've shown you that metabolic imaging using 31 phosphorus MRS is extremely promising in, in measuring mitochondrial function uh, in skeletal muscle non-invasively and has the added advantage of not exhausting our patients to measure mitochondrial function, uh, as has happened with cardiopulmonary exercise tests. The future of treatment in long COVID is likely to be, in my mind, um, therapies with multiple mechanisms or modes of action that improve um, inflammation, vascular health, and restore mitochondrial function. And in this regard, I'm really excited about the, the treatment trial that I'm leading. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. Uh, that was truly fascinating, uh, a subject that's very close to my own heart, so, so uh, lots to talk about afterwards. Um, can I just uh, remind the audience to, to use the live Q&A uh, function, uh, enter your questions there, and we'll be able to go through them and ask the speakers these uh, questions when they uh, return at the end for um, the discussion. Uh, so thanks again, Betty, and we'll we'll see you uh, when you come back for the discussion uh, at the end of the four talks. Um, the next speaker, uh, uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, David Strain from the University of Edinburgh. David can't actually uh, be with us. Um, uh, he's actually away on holiday, uh, but has uh, taken the time and trouble uh, to record um, uh, a lecture for us uh, to make up for the fact that he can't be here uh, in person. Uh, and David's going to talk about treating the immunolo immunological deficits uh, in long COVID. So over to David's video. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is David Strain and thanks for that kind introduction. I'm a clinical senior lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School 
I'm the clinical lead for COVID services at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. I'm BMA rep on the long COVID NHS task force. Um, and in a pre-COVID world, I worked in the Diabetes and Vascular Research Centre based in Exeter, um, one of the world's top centres for the microcircuitry research. Uh, I was also interested interested in ME and CFS through my clinical role and looking at the overlap between them. Indeed, I'm currently the medical advisor for Action for ME and the chair of the CFS ME research collaboration. And therefore, when COVID came along, it was no surprise to many of us that we have this post-COVID syndrome that looked very much like myalgic encephalomyelitis. Now, with post-COVID, there is a whole variety of symptoms. We've been hearing about this over the last couple of days. Um, and it is no surprise that we see multiple different symptoms when this affects multiple different organs of the body. However, that means looking for a treatment for long COVID is going to be organ dependent. Something that might work for the myocarditis is unlikely to work for the kidney failure. Something that works for the microemboli in the brain leading to small vessel disease is very unlikely to work within the spleen. However, we do need to start looking for potential treatments. And these treatments are divided twofold. There are the treatments of the symptoms, and then there's the treatments of the disease. Now, my good friend, Amy Banerjee, is just about to come up and he's going to talk about some of the, the work that they're undergoing with some of the symptomatic treatments that we've pulled from the ME community. Things like loratadine and colchazine that we use widely in ME to treat the underlying symptoms of fatigue and myalgia. However, as yet, there is no underlying treatment that, that can cure long COVID. We're seeing symptoms are starting to resolve, but what we don't really have a handle on is whether these are getting better on their own or whether we genuinely do have a treatment. Now, there are some exceptions of this. I mean, a great exception is um, the, the effect on these microemboli. We know that SARS-CoV-2 does induce the release of platelet factor four by activating the platelets. This produces um, polyglycans on the endothelial cells, such as syndicin and endocin. And then these complexes will generate immunogenic epitopes that will activate the extra follicular beta cells, uh, sorry, B lymphocytes rather, um, that can then generate some type of autoimmunity. This autoimmunity causes platelet aggregation, can cause cellular apoptosis and clearance of the antibody decorated platelets. These platelets, these clots, cause the microemboli. Now, this is one specific type of long COVID, triggered through direct interaction with the virus and their platelets, and this is treated by antiplatelets. In the acute phase, we use a, a high dose of low molecular weight heparins if they've got any evidence of these platelet clots formation with the high D-dimers. In the chronic phase, there are trials underway looking at whether the anticoagulants, the direct oral anticoagulants, such as apixaban or rivaroxaban, will give you the benefit. Now, we hypothesize that this will just be for those who are, are having the clots. However, what we need to know is, is this one of the underlying causes that has a much more widespread impact than the clots that we see in the, the renal impairment or the cerebral small vessel disease? Now, there's several other places that we are getting a better understanding of the pathology. When it comes to the pulmonary pathology, we heard yesterday the, the great reports of how breathing exercises can improve symptomatic breathlessness associated with long COVID. Actually, this goes back as far as the, um, the English National Opera that got a, did a trial with about 200 or so people and are now offering their singing classes to thousands of people across the country to help with their breathless. And let's face it, the ENO giving you singing lessons, it is just giving you those breathing exercises. However, it's unlikely that those breathing exercises are affecting the underlying disease more they are enabling our patients to live with their disease, to adapt to their disease, and to get a better oxygen transference through better utilization of their lungs. The underlying disease, however, 
is much more likely to be associated with a chronic inflammation uh, with a sustained production of the pro-inflammatory cytokines that we are seeing. This is associated with the reactive oxygen species. This is all triggering endothelial cell damage. That accounts very easily for the, the work that Oxford produced with the, the xenon transfer have being reduced. There's no problem with the lung itself. It's at the endothelial microvascular junction where that problem lies. In order to treat that, we need to get down and be treating the underlying inflammation. And to treat the inflammation, we need to know where it's coming from. Indeed, when we go through the whole of the pathology, it, it can all be tracked back looking at these underlying immunological causes. The cardiac myocarditis, myocarditis that we're seeing is associated with elevated levels of interleukin-6 and interleukin-1-beta and TNF-alpha. We're seeing high levels of T cells. This can be fixed with the anti-inflammatory drugs, but we need to be tackling the underlying trigger rather than the resultant inflammation. So too, the neurological pathologies, uh, the cognitive impairments, the extravasation that we see, all comes back to this pro-inflammatory state. Similarly, much of the fatigue can be associated with uh, the um, pro-inflammatory state, although it has to be said, the fatigue element is far more difficult to pin down. So when we come to looking at the potential treatments, we have to say that very little is actually known about it. There's been that headline grabbing 50 million pounds has been invested into UK research and over a billion in the States has been invested. However, just put that into scale. At the moment, there's 1.3 million people in the UK living with long COVID. Therefore, this 50 million pound translates to less than 40 pounds per person with the disease. This is a new disease. We are not learning from other things. This is not like a new type of diabetes that we can learn from. We have the closest disease to this is ME. And despite 40 years worth of knowledge, the latest NICE guidelines for the management of ME said that we don't have sufficient evidence to give good quality guidance. So Let's come back to the um, long COVID. What do we know that might give us a clue as to where the therapy lies? And when it comes to that, let's have a look at the immunological signature of those with long COVID. Because this work published uh, only a few weeks ago in Nature Medicine suggested that those presenting with long COVID have got lower levels of IgM for the level of disease. So these are similar levels of disease, similar presentations, similar incidents in the hospital, but a much lower level of IgM. Actually, when you factor in the number of symptoms, this was even further reduced. Six months down the line, one of the immunoglobulins G, IgG3, was numerically reduced, although this wasn't significant. However, the reason I do pick this up is this has been demonstrated already to be reduced in people with EBV Epstein-Barr virus post-exertional malaise, another form of a lot post-viral syndrome. Now, in both of those cases, that gives... A, a possibility that there could be some virus that doesn't get mopped up in quite the same way in people with long COVID that it does in those who go on to make a full and healthy recovery. What we could be looking at here is a viral um, risk of the viral being perpetuated in immunoprivileged tissues. Those are automatically at slightly lower levels of immunoglobulins, such as the gut. And if you've naturally got a lower level, that brings the level down even further, allowing the virus to stay, replicate, and every so often trigger a surge of inflammation by allowing some of that virus into the blood. Now, of course, at this level, it's never going to test positive on the PCRs or the lateral flows. We're just going to see occasional episodes. We may see a difference in the microbiome, the gut microbiome specifically, and that has already been demonstrated. Now, one of the difficulties when assessing gut microbiome uh, in patients with long COVID is the very fact that they've got long COVID will change their eating habits. 
they'll reach for the high energy foods if they're constantly feeling fatigued, high carbohydrate foods. This may form quite a substantial change in their diet. As a result, that could be the driver of this change in the gut microbiome in people who've got long COVID. That's not to say it's not contributing to their symptoms. However, when we look at those with this post-acute COVID syndrome, the PACS, as it's labeled here, what we do see is the gut microbiome is deranged at diagnosis. That suggests the risk factor for developing long COVID could be a deranged gut microbiome, and therefore good, good, good health could be one of our best ways of preventing long COVID from existing in the first place. However, that also raises the possibility that we may be able to treat uh, long COVID by getting rid of this virus that could be living in the gut. And there's some early anecdotal data suggesting that this could be the case. This is one of the studies that I did very early on um, in conjunction with Long COVID SOS and um, the Zero COVID Alliance in the Netherlands, and then several other groups in the States and Canada and Israel. We were sent out a questionnaire to over a thousand people who've got Long COVID and who'd been had their first dose of vaccine. Now, the reason we did this originally was because we were worried that vaccination, remembering early on, we thought that this was an autoimmune disease. We were worried that vaccination would make their symptoms worse by triggering an exaggerated immune response. And if that immune response was interacting with the cells, making autoimmune disease worse is what you'd expect. What we saw is on average, 67% of our patients felt some improvement in at least one of the domains of their long COVID, most notably in the fatigue, the brain fog and the myalgia. Now, what is difficult to say from this is whether this is just a natural history. Remember, it's two to three weeks later of the disease that we've had for six or seven months. It's unlikely to be the cause. However, it is a possibility. But what we may want to see is, was there a dose-dependent effect? Because we do get a dose-dependent effect in the number of antibodies generated from the vaccines. We saw slightly more antibodies coming with Pfizer than we got with AstraZeneca. We saw many more antibodies from the Moderna than we did from Pfizer. And that's because effectively giving three times the dose of the mRNA with Moderna compared to Pfizer. If this is a genuine impact on the residual virus, we could expect to see a dose dependent effect. And that's exactly what we did see. We saw a significant improvement in symptoms, a 26% improvement in fatigue, a 31% improvement in the brain fog, and 30% improvement in the myalgia with Moderna, which was much greater than seen with the other vaccines. Notably, the most significant difference um, was the improvement in the GI symptoms. The gut health was improved dramatically with a very high dose vaccine. The, the Moderna at three times the amount of um, antigen compared to Pfizer. Um, but we see this massive improvement in gut health. This is all suggesting that the long COVID could be treated in the long term by vaccines recurrent vaccines, maybe on a six or eight month period. I'm saying maybe because we're just about to start the study where we give this and we look for those physiological responses to see can we actually track an improvement in the gut microbiome, a reduction in the cardiac inflammation, improvements in the vascular physiology in patients in the two to three weeks after the dose of a Moderna vaccine to see is this a potential long-term treatment People would say, would you give a monthly or a bi-monthly injection for these symptoms? Well, let's face it, we give daily injections for the management of diabetes. And in the grand scheme of things, $15 for two months worth of treatment is pretty easy to manage. And this would fit with many of the symptoms from long COVID we see that we could be caused by the occasional bursts of the virus into the body. We know that the virus, when we do get these bursts into the body, will interact with the ACE2 enzyme, even at the subclinical level. 
that would block the production of the ANG1 to 7 and ANG1 to 9 that we know stimulate the mitochondrial assembly receptor and fill our body with antioxidants and the anti-inflammatory agents. It will also, through by virtue of having greater levels of circulating angiotensin 1 that's not been converted, promote AT1 receptor, which has a pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic role. Intermittent bursts of the virus just escaping from our gut and into our bloodstream would be enough to cause this increased tissue injury of minimal effort and reduce our tissue protection. It could also be the cause of distant symptoms when you um, experience them distant from the venue, from the location where you're having your exercise, brain exercise causing muscle aches and pains. If this is the underlying cause, it does also highlight a role for another immunoglobulin-based therapy. Ronaprev uh, contains two monoclonal antibodies, both directed against a spike protein. Now, this was incredibly effective in the first um, two waves of the, the, the pandemic. We saw that it was incredibly effective at neutralizing the alpha and the delta variant. It reduced hospitalizations by about 80%. Um, bring in the rates of patients who have been tested with positive with COVID to require treatment in hospital down to less than 1%. Now, when Omicron variant came along, Ronaprev, well, it just didn't work. But that means the manufacturers are currently sat on a whole host of Ronaprev with the possibility of treating our long COVID patients if we can demonstrate that this is due to gut, my gut, gut health. There are other immunoglobulin-based therapies. One thing that was uh, described actually very widely in the news based on a single case is the Aptima BC007. Now this is an immunomodulator, not technically immunoglobulin, it's an immunomodulator that modifies the dysregulation in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a specific one that's uh, due to G-coupled receptors um, and the beta A1, AAB receptor for those who feel the need to know. Now in one patient out of the 12 in that particular study, presented for their trial, phase two trial, with cardiomyopathy and long COVID. And they responded, they reported that their long COVID symptoms that had been present for over 12 months got better within an hour. Now the computer modeling has now been performed that it demonstrated that this um, immunomodulator would impact the association between the COVID and the ACE2 receptors. There are many similarities actually between the SARS-CoV antibodies and the, the GPCR AABs. Therefore, you could be looking at an immunoglobulin-based treatment for people with long COVID. Now the disappointing point here is that patient only responded with their treatment for about 11 days. This then makes it a very regular treatment, not particularly treat, cheap treatment that would be required on a regular basis. However, if that is the case, then surely that can be modified into a different version. We could, of course, just a, a play with how the virus, assuming there is residual virus, interacts with the cells doing the damage. And actually, cannabinoids have been demonstrated very nicely to block cellular entry from SARS-CoV-2. And, and that's true across all variants. It was demonstrated that it didn't matter which mutations you had, whether it be the K417N and N501Y that make up the Omicron, or those originals, the E484K that caused so much damage early on. But the cannabinoids actually block those cellular entry um, at a base level. Not just that. The cannabinoids, specifically cannabidiol and cannabinavirin, um, are, uh, block the interference of COVID on the ACE2 receptor. It blocks the production of interleukin-6. It blocks the, um, the transmembrane serine proteinase, the TSP, that activates the COVID and it blocks the NRP1. All of these are caused by acute COVID, and all of these are seen to be perpetuated in those with long COVID. Who knows, this could be the first 
medical indication on the NHS for the use of medicinal cannabis for the treatment of a condition. Of course, many of our patients are already coming to us telling us that cannabis, uh, that, cannabis that they're receiving from rather dubious sources is giving a benefit. But who knows? As a result of the ongoing clinical trials, this could be the management for the future. Now, there's several other things that have been um, trialed at the moment, and we don't have time to go through them all, uh, but they're all looking at the similar sorts of processes. Nicotinamide to uh, look as a dietary supplement to reduce the cognitive functions by actively crossing the blood brain barrier and moderating the pro inflammatory response. There's looking at probiotic supplements. These are actually the same supplements that we currently use to treat Clostridium difficile toxin and um, diarrhea. Uh, and if you can fix that dysregulation of the gut microbiome, who knows, that might eradicate the virus. There's Laronimab, which is um, a 140 humanized immunoglobulin G4. It's a monoclonal antibody against the CC chemokine receptor type 5. This is one of those antibodies that has been um, activated by COVID and is thought to be important in the perpetuating inflammatory response. We're seeing tocilizumab being trialed, tocilizumab and also cerilumab, both of these monoclonal antibodies against interleukin-6 receptors. We know the IL-6 is one of those key receptors in a cytokine storm in the acute infection. The trials are determined whether this can also benefit those in the long-term infection. And finally, melatonin. Now we know sleep dysregulation is very common in people with long COVID. But also melatonin's got a very potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory function. Who knows? Simple melatonin off the shelves could be the treatment for long COVID in the future. But what I do want to finalize is that management of long COVID is, well, it's an unknown entity. There are a few things that make sense. Things like anticoagulating people who are having clots, the, giving the symptomatic relief to people who are getting the types of symptoms. But the underlying causes and therefore the underlying treatments are still effectively just out of reach. There are early indicators that suggest that immunotherapy targeting any residual virus could be a benefit. But I do want to caveat all of that, that there's a tremendous amount of reporting bias, both when it comes to the studies but also the participants, anecdotal data, even my own questionnaire-based study, 1,000 people. We know that people will only respond to a questionnaire if they have something to say. How many people didn't respond because it made no difference? Therefore, all of these suggestions I've been talking about are going to require validation in longer-term randomized controlled trials. And on that note, I will hand over back to you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David. Uh, it's a real shame David can't be with us uh, today, um, but we are very grateful that he sent this uh, video to us um, uh, to cover his talk today, and a fascinating talk it was. Um, I'm going to move on now to our next speaker, uh, Amitavar uh, Banerjee from uh, uh, University College London, who's going to talk about the Stimulate ICP uh, study and the integrated care pathway uh, for long COVID. So thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much, uh, Dan. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Brilliant. So my, my name's Amitava Banerjee, yeah, Ami for short. I'm a um, professor of clinical data science um, and a consultant cardiologist at, at UCL in BARTS. And today I'm going to be talking about our NIHR funded um, program, Stimulate ICP and Integrated Care Pathways for Long COVID. So uh, coming up with an acronym, um, I realized was, was um, a very small part of the project, but it's what we're trying to do that is it, it, quite comprehensive in, in long COVID because there's so much we don't know. Uh, symptoms, trajectory, inequalities in management, understanding long COVID to address and transform existing 
integrated care pathways stimulate ICP. My conflicts of interest, are, I'm, I'm the PI of, of this study. Um, I'm, I'm a trustee of the South Asian Health Foundation. Um, I'm in, I have a role at the World Heart Federation and I've received research grants from these funders, in, including AstraZeneca, but none of these grants are related to the topic I'm talking about. So I want to mention a, a concept called the learning health system, which is is known in kind of health data science and informatics circles but perhaps not in the water so a learning health system is this idea that um usually science evidence in the form of guidelines and care as in the health care that we provide are three separate silos and and the lack of translation and crosstalk between the three uh, leads to missed opportunities, wastage of resources, and at worst, poor patient uh, experience and poor patient outcomes. So through better linkage of data and of uh, communities of, of um, research care and on the evidence side and the guidelines, we, we hope to have a continuous virtuous spiral in this learning health system. So under the science, it's what is long COVID, under evidence, what are the guidelines on COVID and under care, how do we best treat it? And you have heard from the, the previous talks that there's an awful lot that we still do not know. So my colleague, um, Melissa Heitman, who um, set up and runs the University College London Long COVID Service, uses the phrase, building the plane while we're flying it. In our um, project stimulate ICP. The, there are kind of several, if you like, guiding principles. Firstly, as I've mentioned, this idea that we're trying to affect science, evidence, and care in, in, in unison. Secondly, we have been listening to patients since the beginning, um, because if you go back to the early publications, whether it's national or from WHO, patients have been calling for well over a year and a half, if not two years, recognition, research and rehabilitation. So those are the areas that we've focused on and patients, as, as you'll see, have been involved in various ways. Uh, we are looking at investigation, treatment and rehabilitation. So the whole pathway and uh, not just part of it. Uh, and we want to be adaptive, pragmatic, service oriented and patient led. Adaptive means that we have to be able to change because things are changing in clinical services, sometimes on a weekly basis. Pragmatic so that it's it's scalable uh, and, and you'll see that we're, we're based in the, the UK and particularly in England, the, the long COVID service led by patients. There are several NIHR funded projects. Um, we're working closely with, with a few of them um, listed here. So Locomotion is doing observational and quality improvement work across long COVID clinics. We're working closely with them. The FOSP COVID study, which has been looking at hospitalized COVID and long COVID. The convalesc convalescence study, which is looking at national cohort studies for long COVID. The HEAL COVID study, which is a trial of people who've been hospitalized and looking at outcomes once they've been discharged from hospital. The long COVID core outcome uh, data set um, led by um, Tim Nicholson at King's. And we're also talking to the uh, CLOCK study, which is the pediatric study funded by NHR led by Sir Terence Stevenson and uh, UK Biobank. So let's just uh, think of long COVID as a, as a prevention or public health continuum. On the left here is the kind of very simple common sense thing, which we forget and our governments definitely forgot that keeping infection rates down is and was the best way to prevent long COVID. The best way is to not get COVID in the first place. That's called primordial prevention. Uh, whether that's 
through um, wearing masks and, and, and any other measures that reduce infection. Then it's about recognizing and referring at the right time. Then assessing and investigating and um, guiding people into the right rehabilitation, monitoring, and then support and discharge. So we're really in stimulate ICP concerned with this end here. Although in some of our epidemiology work, we will be able to look at the impact of inf infection suppression as well. Now, integrated care is a concept that has been particularly there um, in, in long-term conditions such as uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, it's there in heart failure as well. So the idea is that you're coordinating and integrating care across primary and secondary care, across multidisciplinary teams, uh, and, and very much more patient focused rather than service focused. Um, and we thought as a team that this was the way to go because otherwise we'll end up with the Indian elephant problem where we're all just looking at one part and actually no one of those parts alone will be enough to tackle the problem. Uh, so, so that's why um, actually if you look around the country, there's many uh, long COVID clinics now um, 90 long COVID clinics that have been set up by NHS England, and they're mostly led by either people in primary care or people who have experience in doing integrated care, particularly from the respiratory community. This is uh, as simple as I could make what we're proposing in Stimulate ICP. Uh, there are three packages of work. Um, that, that we're doing and really the the first work package is where we're at in terms of everything we're doing is meant to be based uh, on services that have already been rolled out because we from the outset wanted to do something that's scalable remember this is already affecting 1.3 million people on the estimates of the office for national statistics so compared with any God-fearing long-term condition, that is a lot of people. So we, we, we have to be thinking of scalable solutions. So the, the um, pictorial representation at the top is firstly, somebody with persistent symptoms after recovery from COVID is referred to the long COVID clinic. They may have tests in the community, such as ECG, simple blood investigations, and then they're assessed in the long COVID clinic to rule out any other um, underlying pathology to confirm long COVID uh, and to decide on the best way of management. David um, alluded to the fact that at the moment there um, are no uh, evidence-based therapies yet. There are starting to be trials going on, um, but as, as yet we are using things in clinic off-label. Uh, and, and then rehabilitation in the community that's mostly self-managed. So in, in the first work package, we're looking at the trajectory of disease and the effectiveness of the care pathway, so-called usual care. In the second work package, which is the main meat of our project, we're doing a complex intervention trial. And it's complex in that it's an integrated care pathway intervention. So we have, if I enlarge it there, an, in, an investigation cover scan, which is a 35 minute multi-organ MRI scan that is done before people go to long COVID clinic to look for any organ impairment uh, ac across the, the, the major organs, except for the brain. Um, the, and, and the other intervention is living with COVID recovery, which is a digital health um, rehabilitation platform uh, and so people are cluster randomized at the um, primary care network level to one or both of these interventions and then when people come to the clinic they are individual level randomized to one of these drugs or no drugs so there are four arms in this drug trial 
there's rivaroxaban, which you heard about from David Strain, is an anticoagulant. Uh, and the idea there is that we're um, counteracting the, the, the microclots in that hypothesis. Colchicine, an anti-inflammatory that's licensed for use in pericarditis and um, myocarditis and is being used by um, many clinicians in, in clinics. Uh, and then finally, an antihistamine combination of loratadine and famotidine, um, thinking that uh, along the lines of the mast cell activation route. So th this is a platform trial. Uh, we aim to um, recruit 4,500 people over 10 to 12 months with three months of follow-up. Uh, and the out primary outcome is fatigue on the fatigue assessment scale, but uh, we accept that in this kind of we don't know so much scenario, primary outcomes are probably not the right model. So we have a whole battery of secondary outcomes, including time off work, physical, functional, um, and psychological outcomes to, to look, at, look more holistically. This is uh, a, a major um, team effort across the country. I should have mentioned uh, that we are um, looking at six centres in particular, but um, scaling up beyond that. So the six centres are Hull, Leicester, Liverpool, Derby, Exeter, and University College London. But we have partners there um, who are more on the policy side, we have industry partners, particularly developing the two interventions perspective and living with. Uh, we have in, um, com companies who are more involved in the logistics of, for example, delivering the scans, omics, uh, and, and various local networks. So this is a huge team effort. I've just realized I missed the third part of our project, which is so important that work package three is uh, looking at two things. One is looking at inequalities in existing care and within our trial, who are we not reaching with our care pathway, whether that's by geography, ethnicity, and other um, metrics. And also we are looking beyond the pandemic to compare the pathway of long COVID with other long-term conditions uh, in, in a piece of work that's being led by my colleague Christina uh, van der Veltz Cornelius a psychiatrist in um, uh, York University, but looking at both physical and mental health, long-term long conditions. Uh, this I won't go through all of this, but we in each of those work packages, there are two sub-work packages. And just to say, we've thought very carefully about how we have patients involved in the co-leadership of each of those sub-work packages and overall um, and and there's also clinical leadership as well as academic leadership um, so, so that we are keeping our finger on the pulse so to speak the timeline is that we started in august uh, there was a lot of um toing and throwing um from uh, first of all the therapeutic task force about whether these were the right drugs. So for those of you who don't know, all of the drugs in platform trials, whether it's recovery trial, heal COVID, and then stimulate ICP, have to undergo full approval by the therapeutic task force. And, and so we as investigators or the, the, the public can suggest drugs, but they have to go for independent approval. And then we apply for ethical approval. Um, and we're, we're in the last stage of MHRA approval and still aiming to start in mid-March. Uh, that would allow us to report full results in Q2 of next year and preliminary results uh, in the later part of this year. Um, and the trajectory work in epidemiology work, um, we would hope to report later this year using long COVID national data, as well as site-specific data in those six long COVID clinic sites I mentioned. And we're also using the NHS Digital Trusted Research Environment to look more nationally. We're doing a big piece of work 
in Health Economics, led by my colleague Paula Lorgelli from UCL and Professor of Health Economics, and uh, to, to look at the healthcare utilisation in long COVID, because um, we're doing a lot of tests and a lot of um, investigations, which um, may not all be needed. Um, the major a major part which is maybe um, useful to this audience is that uh, in the 4,500 participants we are gathering um, baseline blood samples and hopefully blood samples that follow up as well which will be open to the wider scientific community um, and we hope later in the year to report on the wet package tree health inequalities and long-term conditions. I'll stop there. Sorry if I overran and happy to take questions. Thank you very much indeed, Amy. That was um, really, really interesting. Uh, and uh, there'll be lots to come back to in the discussion afterwards. So thanks very much uh, indeed. Um, OK, on to the uh, fourth and final uh, speaker uh, in this session. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Baker from um, Newcastle University who's going to talk today about investigating the effects of non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation uh, in post-COVID fatigue. So thank you very much, Mark. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there's a problem with the uh, web software. Thank you for the, to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak at this meeting. My name is Mark Baker. I split my time between working as a consultant at the RBI in Newcastle and working as a research scientist at uh, Newcastle University. By way of warning, uh, I won't be presenting any results in this talk talk is instead more of an advertisement of a, for a study that is underway in Newcastle. These data from the Office for National Statistics will be very familiar to everyone here. A staggering 2% of the UK population are currently experiencing persistent symptoms following COVID-19. And this appears to be an increasing problem as illustrated in this figure from the ONS. Half of these who are reporting persistent symptoms are complaining of fatigue. Long COVID is going to continue to have a huge impact on all aspects of our society, unless we can identify novel ways of treating long COVID particularly the more common components of the disease, such as fatigue, as has been recognized now by funding agencies. What is the rationale for using vagus nerve stimulation in post-COVID fatigue? Well, clinical observations have consistently demonstrated an association between autonomic dysfunction and fatigue. For example, symptoms of autonomic dysfunction are common among many chronic diseases associated with fatigue. These include systemic lupus erythematosus, Sjogren's syndrome, and primary biliary cirrhosis, to name but a few. Moreover, autonomic dysfunction correlates with fatigue severity in these conditions. The prevailing problem is one of sympathetic overactivity, as we've heard from other talks, reminiscent of a chronic stress response. These observations have led many to ask the question, is this simply an epiphenomenon or is sympathetic overdrive contributing to the pathophysiology of fatigue? In theory, by stimulating the vagus nerve and thus activating parasympathetic pathways, it should be possible to counteract this sympathetic overactivity. 
if sympathetic overdrive is contributing to the pathophysiology of fatigue, then if vagus nerve stimulation reduces sympathetic overactivity, it should also reduce symptoms of fatigue. There is now growing evidence that vagus nerve stimulation does indeed do this. Here is one example, uh, an open label pilot study in 15 patients with Sjogren's syndrome published by one of my co-investigators, Professor Fai Ong. This study used a gamma core device made by an American company, Electrical, to stimulate the vagus nerve transcutaneously in the neck. Treatment was self-administered twice daily for 28 days, and fatigue assessed by questionnaires. Blood samples were also taken. Fai and his colleagues showed that non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation is associated with improvements in physical fatigue and in sleepiness in this small sample of patients. Moreover, the change in fatigue was correlated with counts of white cell subsets here, natural killer T cells and T cells. Similarly, in another study in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus, where on this study, vagus nerve was stimulated non-invasively by its auricular branch, which innervates a portion of the ear. Patients who received active transauricular vagus nerve stimulation had reduced fatigue compared with those who received sham stimulation. Those who heard my colleague Dimitris Sotoropoulos speaking earlier will know about our MRC funded study that tested a large number of physiological and behavioral measures in a cohort of people with post COVID fatigue and age match controls. As Demetrius reported, this study not only showed a significant association between fatigue and autonomic dysfunction in this group with post-COVID fatigue, measures indicating autonomic dysfunction are highlighted in red in this plot, but also changes in cortical excitability tested with transcranial magnetic stimulation as highlighted here in blue and in neuromuscular excitability measured using twitch interpolation highlighted here in green. Based on the positive results of non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation in other conditions associated with fatigue, we plan to look at the effects of non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation on post COVID fatigue in a randomized controlled study funded by the National Institute for Health Research. <coughs> We've given this acronym. We have elected to use an existing TENS device, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation device shown here, to stimulate the auricular branch of the vagus nerve via a clip electrode attached to the tragus. By using this approach, it should make it easier to roll out this intervention in the target patient population if successful. We aim to recruit 96 patients, participants. In addition to fatigue assessments at baseline and during the study, we will test the same neurophysiological and behavioral measures identified in our MRC study and monitor autonomic parameters and physical activity in the home using wearable technology. Participants will be randomized to three groups. Active transauricular vagus nerve stimulation, sham transauricular vagus nerve stimulation, where the clip electrode is attached to the tragus, but when the stimulator is turned on, no electrical stimulation arrives at the ear or an active control 
where the clip is connected to the earlobe and this is then stimulated by the TENS device. This activates the greater auricular nerve and not the vagus nerve. Participants will receive this intervention initially after eight weeks. Initially, sorry, for eight weeks. After this, all participants will receive a further eight weeks of open label, active, non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. Our study has two aims. Firstly, to establish whether transricular vagus nerve stimulation can improve symptoms of fatigue in post-COVID fatigue. And a secondary aim, which is mechanistic, is if vagus nerve stimulation does reduce fatigue, which of the measures we identified in our MRC study are also affected by vagus nerve stimulation and thus potentially play a causal role in fatigue in long COVID rather than being an epiphenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, so we're going to, with all the talks done now, we're going to move to the um, discussion section um, of this um, uh, session. And I should be rejoined now by the speakers uh, from the session. Uh, along with uh, Andrew Johnson uh, from the University of Naples, uh, Federico II, and Andrew Simpson uh, from the University of Hull. So uh, welcome to both of the Andrews and uh, hopefully all of the other speakers from the session, bar David, who uh, is uh, out of the country at the moment. So uh, uh, thank you all um, for speaking. Uh, such a wide variety of topics you've covered, but all really focusing on this very difficult uh, topic of how we treat a disease that we don't fully understand. I think uh, I've made all sorts of notes uh, as we've been going on uh, through the session. And I'm just going to start with a couple of broad questions, but um, I just want to come back to uh, uh, something that Amy mentioned, first of all. Um, this, this, this phrase you had uh, sort of made me smile uh, and also filled me with dread. This building the plane whilst we are still flying on it remind me of sort of two years ago turning up to ward rounds on the intensive care unit uh, every day with rows and rows of ventilated patients with, with a disease we had no understanding about whatsoever. Uh, and this sort of feels a little bit the same in, in, in the sort of long term uh, follow up of these patients. These patients are still affected uh, by the disease that they had. Uh, and really, we, we're trying to find treatments when we don't really fully understand the pathophysiology. So this, uh, perhaps the long term, is, is quite comparable to what we do uh, from my perspective when we're acutely uh, treating these patients. So, so I want to uh, kick things off, really. And I was listening to one of the sessions yesterday, uh, and there was some sort of debate between the speakers um, about really whether we're going to find a sort of... Um, one, one size fits all uh, therapy to, to treat this disease or whether, uh, as mentioned by Betty, we, we need to really focus on um, pathological phenotypes and hone in on those with a more sort of stratified, personalized approach to treating these patients, depending uh, on what clusters of symptoms they uh, present with. So I wonder, in no particular order, if any of you had any sort of views or thoughts about whether we are just going to find a wonder drug, uh, you know, something like melatonin, for example, that was mentioned, uh, that's just going to cure all these problems, or that there's going to be a, a, a real stratified approach to this, depending on those uh, phenotypic clusters. So uh, does anyone want to start us off on that? I, I, I um, will have a go to start with. We, Thank you. We, had to think about this in in two ways in our study first of all uh, which drugs to to trial and secondly whether we should be using them in all comers or whether we should be using them in particular subtypes or strata on the latter point we opted for uh, all comers not because we we disagree with with Betty's thought, which I, I fully agree with, but I'm not sure that we yet know what those subtypes should be. So, for example, in Colchicine, with Colchicine, should we only be using that in people who have established myocarditis on MRI scan? And we we were of the view that actually there's an awful lot of un, 
undiagnosed inflammation, probably there's there's this um, inflammation that's missed by existing imaging, and and there might be benefit in a broader population. So so again, we are defining the subtypes even within the trial. And if late if while the trial is running, we preliminary interim analysis shows that we should be using particular drugs in in particular patients. That's what we will do. Uh, but we're, we're we're in kind of uncharted territory here, Dan. That, um, if we compare with, say, what I do in my pre-pandemic job, or you know what I've been doing this morning, look, looking at people with heart failure or post-heart um, attack, these are very well-defined international consensus definitions with biomarkers and so on. We're not there yet with this disease to to know what those strata are. So, so I think it's likely that there will be um, different strata and, and that it is a syndrome. But at the moment. We haven't got that information. And, and Betty, what do you think about this? Your uh, your talk was uh, really interesting, but very much focused on the skeletal muscle and the fatigue associated uh, with that. And uh, it'd be interesting to know whether you think the same uh, pathological processes occur in the skeletal muscle might be occurring, say, in the brain and, and the heart uh, as well. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, I completely agree with Ami. Ideally, um, you know, we want to uh, we want this drug to be effective in as we want a drug to be effective in as, as in as many uh, people as possible. Um, and I'll talk about my my presentation as well um, as a second point. I think what I wanted to raise was that one of the concerns I have with um, with a blanket approach where you don't follow precision medicine and test a specific hypothesis uh, is the potential for missing treatment effect. Um, and that was something that we had to think very carefully about in our local study. I know it's a very small study in comparison to your massive study, Ami, but um, I think one of the things that we had to do was, uh, you know, like enrich our population with those with, with mitochondrial dysfunction to see whether this drug works in people with fatigue and mitochondrial dysfunction to answer the specific question. And that's the fear many of us have when we have really large clinical trials that don't target um, you know uh, that 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 don't necessarily follow the precision medicine approach. Just moving on to my talk, um, I did start off my presentation with a slide uh, with the various hypotheses, and that was really intentional because um, you know I I do believe that there are s s several clusters, um, and it, it's certainly emerging. Uh, not just from um, my work with the Excella study, but I'm a co-investigator with FOSP. And many of you might know that the FOSP is a national consortium follow-up study of people who were previously hospitalized. And they've put out two really nice papers where they've shown a strong association between inflammatory um, cytokines, um, CRP, and ongoing symptoms. So um, I've kept a very open mind about long COVID and the, the various clusters. Um, uh, and uh, in some ways, I went to a part which no one else, uh, you know, fatigue with no other explanation, no blood, no abnormal blood test, no pathology, no nothing. How do we help these people? Um, and, and actually, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best here. We're just looking at the various uh, clusters and identifying uh, all possible mechanisms that, that might uh, contribute to symptoms in patients. And Mark, your, um, if I understood it correctly, your uh, proposed study uh, will also be looking to combat the, the fatigue symptom, but by again, by a completely different uh, route through vagus nerve uh, stimulation. What do you, what do you think uh, vagus nerve stimulation, um, do you think it may have benefits for some of these other uh, symptom clusters as well? I, I think I'm in danger of um providing consensus to the, to the general view of this panel. I, I mean, I think this, this is going to have to be a stratified approach and not every treatment is going to work for every individual. That's what we see when I'm treating patients with neurology, neurological disorders. It's, it's not uncommon. So um, that's, I think that's, I think that's where we're going to be. Any other comments uh, on this uh, quite tricky subject? I think j just to, to add to that, yes, the, not every treatment is going to work for every individual, but there's also going to be treatments that, that probably work would work for individuals, but we can't access them and or they, they don't access the treatment. And Ami touched on it, and it's a huge issue, I think, with, with the inequalities. 
the, the study that I presented earlier today was about mobile health and, and we showed on mobile health uh, tele rehabilitation and we showed positive effects. But we, we had a very biased sample. Our, our sample were individuals that were, were literate in digital technology and, and could access it. And there's going to be a whole heap of people that not just telehealth, but, but other aspects that, that won't get the treatments that could potentially work. And uh, again, it, it's more of a problem than a solution here, but it, it's, a, it's a big aspect. And I was glad to see it in, in Ami's presentation as a, as a whole work package in there. Uh, I agree, because this is clearly going to affect people around the world, uh, and not everyone has access to um, MR spectroscopy and whole body MRIs and, and high tech apps uh, to, to aid their diagnosis uh, and therapy. So uh, it is going to be, whilst we're, we're thinking quite UK centrically here, uh, that, that the, these are going to be very difficult to roll out uh, around the planet for, for certain areas. Um, Andrew Johnson, do you uh, any? Uh, I, I think it really. To this? I think it really depends upon the cause of, of long COVID. Uh, for for example, if if this if long COVID is caused by mini biomes, then if we can shift the mini biome at the same time, uh, the vaccination can uh, rid uh, sort of the virion um, contained within that biome then we should be able to uh, remove long COVID if that's the cause. But um, so, so saying, uh, long, long COVID is uh, spread throughout many different um, uh, organs in the body. And for each organ, it will uh, have a, a different um, effect. And so the organs were, will have to be, the, the treatments, I suppose, will have to be separate. Um, so I agree, but I think that there is a possibility if we find the cause that we will be able to treat it more effectively. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and selfishly now, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna ask a question about what I should be doing uh, as an intensive care physician, because what we're talking about here is the treatment for long COVID. And, and surely as we, in medicine, the old saying, uh, uh, as prevention is better than a cure, are there things that we should be doing on the front line for patients when they're acutely unwell to, to try and prevent them from developing uh, long COVID? Many of the therapies uh, mentioned in David's talk uh, were just part of the armament that we literally throw at patients now when they come into the intensive care unit in the hope that we will you know, reduce viral load, reduce inflammatory responses, prevent microthrombi, and various things like that. Um, are, are, are we doing uh, the right thing uh, in the acute phase? And, and are there things that we have missed that, that, that may be of value to these patients uh, further on down the line? Anyone, anyone want to give that a go? May I um, start? So, 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 I'm I'm um, a cardiologist. Manifestly, I, I have no business dealing with an infectious disease or its complications. Uh, like, and, and Betty also is a cardiologist, I know. But but the reason I got involved with COVID research was because since the early stages, we knew that underlying conditions and increased age multimorbidity were key factors, and that's. Um, still true with with hospitalised long COVID. The 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 fly in the ointment is that we have a large population of non hospitalised individuals where most of the um, SARS CoV two infection has happened, and they have significant functional impairment and a significant burden of this disease. And we haven't quite figured out other than specific conditions like asthma and diabetes, what, what the added risk is in that population. But I think to answer your question, the, that if you have less organ impairment and a, a less protracted acute stay, the chances are you will have less severe long COVID. Uh, that's that's clear from, from various cohorts around the world now. And, and okay. so keep doing what you're doing, I would say. I would say. Uh, but but um, there, there's, David alluded to uh, you know, the potential role of antivirals and, uh, and antibodies and so on. Uh, 
I personally am concerned about this because the, of the scale and the accessibility. Andrew Simpson was talking about it. Are we really talking about people putting people at the scale that, that we know there is long COVID out there? We're putting that whole population on antivirals and antibodies. This this doesn't sound plausible to me, which is why you know when I when I kind of um, flippantly said primary primordial prevention has been thrown away by our government. That that was the best way to do something about this. Absolutely. Anybody else uh, wish to comment on that? Um, uh, I think um, something that, that sort of triggered in my mind what, during the, the course of these talks as well, uh, sort of related to this, was was about the fact that um, the severity of the original disease is um, uh, is an important factor in the development of long COVID. But but certainly, if you have mild disease, it's not preventative of long COVID. So, and do you, do you think that these sort of intricate um, explanations such as uh, Beth, you described very beautifully the mitochondrial dysfunction that's occurring in skeletal muscle. Uh, I, I can fully understand that in a critically ill patient in an intensive care unit or perhaps a hospitalized patient. But is the sort of average patient at home who just has, has sort of mild symptoms or could be asymptomatic even, do you think they're undergoing mitochondrial dysfunction during their acute illness and we're just not seeing it and all these other uh, uh, sort of uh, immunological uh, changes. It's, it's just hard to sort of piece it all together to me that, that uh, such a wide uh, range of uh, symptoms and severities are, are leading to a similar outcome. Yeah, I mean, it is a complicated um, matter for sure. Uh, but one thing we are certain is that the CPET findings that I presented are not limited to hospitalized patients, but people in the community as well. Um, and I can tell you from my uh, from the clinical trial I'm, I'm running, there are people who are previously athletic, who had you know peak VO2s of 60, 70, and now they're really crippled by long COVID and they've got quite marked impairment in oxygen consumption, and they did not have severe infection. So you know something is happening whether that's deconditioning, whether that's, I mean, it's, it's a really complicated um, disease to unpick. Um, and I think, you know, the, these advances in technology, whether it's MRS, you know, whether it's anything else, uh, will help us um, disentangle this complex disease. It's interesting that you mention deconditioning because it, it was one of the questions that came up in the, in the, in the chat feed and it was something that I was thinking about whilst you were talking that how much of how much of that reduced peak oxygen uh, consumption is deconditioning and, and how much of it is potentially mitochondrial um, uh, failure because most people who are unwell and uh, sort of lie in bed for two weeks say uh, would would be deconditioned after that but but you would expect them to regain their function quite soon afterwards I suppose. Yeah, so um, I use I shouldn't use a word uh, deconditioning so frivolously in the context of CPET because there are some um, experts who 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 are, who are aware that some of these patterns are not deconditioning but actually no, no. problems with um, oxygen extraction. Um, again, I think uh, this is quite a mixed area. Um, you know, there's ev the, ev the there's evidence in favor of deconditioning, and others that say, okay, this is purely a mitochondrial. Um, pathology, mitochondrial disease. Um, and I, I don't think it's black and white. I think deconditioning does have a role to play as well. Um, but I, and I think this placebo controlled blinded study might shed some light into um, how much of this is primarily mitochondrial and how much is, you know, deconditioning that will not impact on, on our results. Thank you very much. One uh, sort of approach to therapy that uh, I heard no one talk about, uh, but but also came up in the in the chat feed and uh, reminded me of a of a very interesting talk I saw at the hypoxia conference a number of years ago, uh, was the use of either hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, or intermittent hypoxic therapy uh, as a treatment for uh, long COVID. Uh, I think um, in terms of the, the hypoxia conference talk that I saw, uh, it was very much the, the use of intermittent hypoxia uh, as therapy for mitochondrial disorders. Uh, the chance finding of the group uh, that presented it, uh, but, but a real breakthrough uh, 
uh, in the treatment of mitochondrial therapy. So I don't know if any of you uh, know of any information about that or, or would care to speculate on whether you thought that it might work in any way. I'm afraid I'm not an expert in hyperbaric oxygen yeah. therapy, but, but I do know okay. that there's been, uh, but I can tell you that this is really popular among many patients in whom they've had exhaustive tests and, and they're, uh, they're really interested in how this is going to help them or whether it will help them. No one else uh, expert in this area? Dan, I was going to suggest yeah. that you perhaps are the expert in this area. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> I don't, uh, so I don't know the answer to it, but I, I can imagine that it's being looked at uh, somewhere. I've certainly not read anything about it. We were uh, presented certainly in the early phases of COVID with people suggesting uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy may be useful in the acute phase. Uh, but given, um, given that uh, a lot of this uh, has certain, uh, of the problems with long COVID has been put down to a potential uh, failure of oxygen delivery, uh, be that sort of at the microcirculation, or failure of oxygen utilization within the mitochondria, maybe maybe either hyperoxia or hypoxia uh, could be could be useful there. All, all I'd say maybe is Dan that um, hmm. I, I think these these are things that um, we need to do at experimental studies, um, and and um, you you may. Uh, have, have heard about people having extracorporeal apheresis yeah. and treatments like Absolutely. this. And, and actually, I'm at the other end of the spectrum where we have a patient group who uh, for nearly two years have had symptoms and are desperate to try something. Mm. And we, we, we as, as clinicians, as researchers, have to be honest about what we don't know and not be um, promoting things because there's, there's all manner of things that people are trying and not aware that it's not at all evidence-based and at best is at the preliminary stage. Um, um, a question has come up in the in the chat uh, about a drug which we've certainly been using in trials uh, acutely as well which is ACE inhibitors um, and uh, it, it makes sense that they may work uh, in terms of how the, the virus enters uh, cells. And certainly there was a lot of focus on it at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, that we should be either, uh, well, nobody's really sure, withholding them, giving them, uh, and they've certainly been uh, looked at in some of the platform trials that are running in, in acute care. Um, do, does anyone want to sort of hazard a guess or run through uh, their thoughts on the use of ACE inhibitors um, uh, more for the treatment of long COVID, or because uh, it certainly wasn't mentioned in in, in David's array of, of potential uh, therapies. So, I mean, I, I can probably so I I can see the rationale of ACE inhibitors in the long term in people with um, with a bit high burden of inflammation because uh, there's quite strong compelling evidence in the cardiology literature for benefits of ACE inhibitor um, in ischemic heart disease as well as heart failure. Um, so perhaps from a, a long-term prognostic perspective, there might be some benefits. Obviously, this needs to be tested. But I, I, do, um, you know, I do question its benefits for symptoms. Um, and perhaps, Ami, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, no, I'd, I'd agree. I was, I was just thinking through a ACE inhibitors is one of those things where we, where we haven't got we, we haven't got data to support the hypotheses that you said, Dan. We were thinking about early on in the pandemic, and when we're thinking about drugs and treatments to trial in long COVID, do we take off the table all the things that weren't successful in acute COVID? Uh, and, and people have been concerned about culture scene in, in our case yeah. for that. Uh, um, people have, whereas have suggested hydroxychloroquine, and it's yeah. it's really in, an interesting point because you know is 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 it just a continuation of acute COVID or is it something else? And, and it's probably several mechanisms. Thank you very much. I've just seen in the in the the chat feed there that there's uh, someone has put some links to uh, some studies with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, so we can perhaps 
have a look into that uh, after the session. There's a minute to go. Uh, so really, I just want to round up uh, by thanking all the speakers uh, and to Andrew Simpson and Andrew Johnson, who joined us uh, for this discussion. Uh, and really to say that um, just such interesting talks, actually, for such a, an impossible uh, task, it seems, to, to solve uh, the treatment of a disease that we have yet to understand. Uh, an array of really interesting uh, different pharmacological uh, and other types of interventions. Uh, and I think also this, uh, this real thought that we have to have an integrated approach uh, to treating these patients uh, rather than all thinking in silos uh, around the country and, um, uh, and in fact around the world. So thank you very much to all the speakers and thank you to the audience uh, for listening uh, and um, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.